This is a tutorial illustrating the ways in which pattern matching can be used to achieve things that are normally achieved by more conventional programming methods. In particular I shall show how to test whether a list is sorted, for instance a list of numbers might be sorted in increasing order or in decreasing order using the POP11 pattern matcher. A video tutorial based on this file will be available on YouTube, I'm not sure about the total time, and um, the location will probably be different from this, so I'll delete that. So the teach file shows how to use a pattern matcher to check whether a list of numbers is sorted in increasing order and compares that technique with the more conventional way of defining a procedure to check whether a list is sorted. The demonstration uses the POP11 pattern matcher which is described in the teach matches file which is also online in the poplog teach directory and is summarized with more of the facilities uh, uh, described in the help matches file in the pop help directory. I shall only be demonstrating a tiny subset of what matches does and later I shall show how a limitation of the matches um, operator can be overcome by using something called does match. So we can start by presenting a fairly standard definition for the sorted procedure, the kind of definition that might be given in Lisp, in Scheme and in many other programming languages, except I shall use POP11. So we got, want to define a procedure called sorted, which takes as input a list and returns an output which is called result, where the list is a list of numbers and result is a boolean, true or false. It's used in programs requiring to distinguish a sorted list of numbers from others. And we'll have a collection of tests that we can run through after we've defined the procedure. So <coughs> a standard way to define the sorted test is to assume that every non-empty list L has a first element, its head, oops, that shouldn't have an apostrophe, namely the head of L, HD in POP11, in Lisp that would be CAR, C-A-R, for historical reasons that I won't go into. And in addition to the head, if it's a non-empty list, it'll have a sublist containing all the other elements, namely the tail of the list, which in POP11 is TL of L. In Lisp that would be CDR, CDR of L. So the first element of list, L, is head of L. This, if it's a non-empty list. If it's an empty list, then in POP11 that will produce an error. You can't ask for the head of an empty list. That's different in some other programming languages. The second element will be the head of the tail. So the tail of, the of L is everything except the first element. So it will be the second, third, fourth, if there are, are such things and um, if there are any more than the first element then the head of the tail will be the second element in Lisp that would be the car of the kidder of L which can be summarized as CADR so if we have a list cat, dog, mouse, elephant, horse list of words then the first element namely the head of L is word cat the tail is the list dog, mouse, elephant, horse and then the head of the tail would be the word dog and the head of the tail of the tail would be the word mouse and so on right so now we can define our procedure sorted which is going to take any list as input or, or rather any list of numbers as input including possibly empty list and return a result which will be uh, boolean true or false now if a list has length less than two that's to say if it's empty then it's already sorted there's nothing that's in decreasing order um, if its length is one then it's already sorted so if the length of the list is less than two then we can say that the result is true it's sorted so a list containing just the word six is sorted otherwise it's got uh, two or more elements and then we have to check uh, that the 
items are in the right order. So we can first check the first two elements. If the head of the list, which is the first element, is less than or equal to the head of the tail of the list, which is the second element, then it's in ascending order. And if it is, then we have to check that the tail of the list is in ascending order. So this test shows that the beginning of a list of at least two elements is in order, and then this shows that the rest of the list is in order. That test can fail, and that test can fail. If either of them fails, then f false will be assigned to result. Uh, if they both succeed, then true will be assigned to result. And that's the end of that procedure definition. So I'm going to compile it by putting the cursor in there and typing escape C, and it says it's compiled. Done. We can now go back and test that that works on our test cases here. And the reason I've left the upper half of this uh, little window blank is that another file will be created for output. So I test whether the empty list is sorted, and we want that to produce the result true. And sure enough, it produces the result true up there. The list 3, 5 should be sorted. We try that, and that's true. The list 5, 5 should be sorted, and that's true. The list 5, 4 should not be sorted. So we try that, and we get false. And this list, which is 1, 3, 6, 6, 9, 10, 14, should be sorted. And that's true. And this one, which is 1, 3, 6, 9, 14, 10, should not be sorted because at the end there are two elements in decreasing order. And that's false up there. OK, so uh, here's one that's in decreasing order all the way, and of course that's false. So we can um, check what's, uh, how the procedure works by tracing it. The procedure sorted can be traced. I type escape D. It's traced, we get done. So now I can go back and try some of these things. So I'll check whether the sorted, uh, whether the empty list is sorted, and it says it's checking that, and it comes out with result true. That was easy. If I give it this list, is that sorted? Well, it will um, escape D. It says it's trying to check if the list 3, 5 is sorted. When it finds the first two elements are sorted, so it tries to tailor the list, which is that. And then that is sorted because it's only got one element. So that's true, and the whole thing is sorted. What about one of this, this long one here? Well, we can try that one, 5, 4. Um, it doesn't get as far as 3, 5 because the first test, 5, 4, fails because 4 comes uh, is uh, comes off to 4 but is smaller than 5. 4 comes off to 5 but is smaller in that list. So that one's false. Here we have a longer example and it goes into uh, sorted with the whole list. It checks the first two elements. They're OK, so it checks the tail. And the first two elements are OK, so it checks the tail. The first two elements are OK, it checks the tail. And so it goes away all to the end. And everything's true. So all those tests come out true, and the whole thing is true. However, if we do this one down here, um, escape D, and now we get sorted 1, 3, 6, 9, 14, 10. As before, the first two are OK, so it tries the tail. The first two are OK, so it tries the tail. And so it goes on until it gets to th these two. And uh, then that fails. And because that fails, everything else fails. The whole thing is false. It took quite a long time to fail in that case. If I choose this list here, um, which starts 9, 8, 7, 6, and so on, the one that goes in reverse order, well, that one fails right at the beginning because the first two numbers are not in the right order, so it doesn't bother testing all the tails. So you can see that sometimes uh, giving two lists of the same size to a procedure like sorted won't necessarily cause the same amount of work to be done. One might terminate much faster than the other. OK, we can turn tracing off. And so if I did that last example again, it would just run and produce a result without the tracing. Tracing is very useful for debugging procedures, especially procedures that are recursive. 
So this is the way, this is what we've just been looking at, this definition of sorted. And I want to introduce an alternative using the POP11 pattern matcher, um, which in some ways is more intuitive because it shows a picture of what we're looking for. And we're going to, uh, just to be different, define a procedure which will check whether a list is in descending order. So, um, sorry, we're going to check whether it's in ascending order, but in order to check whether it's in ascending order, we have to see if there's a pair of items which are in descending order. So we define a little predicate called descends, which takes a list, and it's going to be applied when we found a list of two items. And it'll be true if the list contains two items in descending order. Otherwise it'll be false. Now, th this is a bit confusing because this is the thing which is going to check that our list is not in ascending order. So, when this thing comes out true, that means that our uh, test for s the list being sorted, which we're going to call match sorted, is going to come out false. And that's a bit like the previous case where um, we said Uh, if we had put this the other way around, we'd said um, if, sorry, this one here, if we'd had the second item um, instead of being greater than the first, if it had been less than the first, then that would have been the a test that had failed. Uh, in this case, we just expressed it that way around. Anyhow, we're going to use this test, which is um, descends to decide if that list contains a pair of items that are in descending order. How do we do that? We say that uh, this list will be matched against this pattern. And this pattern contains two variables, x and y, so you declare those variables, x and y. We need this exclamation mark for technical reasons that I won't go into here. Um, so, w the list matches this two element pattern and y is less than x or we could have it the other way around uh, x is greater than y so if we find this let's change it the other way around and x is greater than y so if we find that uh, the items are in descending order then this thing would turn a true result if there aren't two items in the list, or if there are more than two items, it'll return a false result. So whenever this thing fi returns a true result, we've proved that the list is not sorted in ascending order. So this is going to be something looking for counterexamples for the hypothesis that the list is sorted. And we're going to use it inside this procedure, match sorted, which takes a list of numbers and produces a Boolean result as before. And here are some tests that we're going to use when we've defined the procedure. How do we define it? Well, the procedure match sorted takes a list as input, and produces a result which is true or false. It's going to use a local variable to uh, name a sublist that it finds in that list. So we're going to use matches, but now we're going to use it in a different way from before. Here we're going to say, uh, we're going to look to see if the list, our input list, matches this pattern. And this pattern says we've got some stuff at the beginning and we've got some stuff at the end. And the double equal means that any amount of stuff, it can be an em empty, there can be nothing there, or there can be one item or two items or three items. And likewise at the end, there can be nothing after this or one item, two items, three items, any number. And in here, we're going to find some list of arbitrary length. That's what double query means. Previously we had a single query in the previous example uh, that would match only one item, but here we have a double query which will match an arbitrary number of items, but we're going to restrict that match. Namely, it must satisfy the test descends. And remember, previously we defined descends as a procedure which checks that it's being applied to a list of length 2 where 
the first item in the list exceeds the second item. It's a bigger number. Um, this notation with a colon followed by a procedure is used in patterns in POP11. In, in this context, descend will be called a restriction procedure. It restricts the kinds of things that can take the value of items for this match to succeed. So if you find something where there are two items in descending order, then this match will, dis will succeed. If it succeeds, then our match sorted uh, procedure must return false. So we put a not there to say that it's not sorted because it found something in descending order. So escape C to compile that. That's done. Now we can go back to our tests. As before, the I'm going to clear the output window. Clear. Come back here. Match sorted gives true with the empty list with a two element list um, three five. It gives true with five five. It gives true with five four. It gives false. And then we can also try uh, with longer lists uh, one three six nine ten fourteen. That's true. If we swap the last two items, it's false. And if we have everything in descending order, it's false. And that's a long. There are more tests here. Now we can check what's going on by tracing the descends procedure that was used in match sorted. Remember, match sorted checked that the items found in the search for a pattern uh, for a way of matching the list against the pattern the items are in descending order and of length 2. So we can trace that uh, which is now done. I typed escape D on that line and go back and do this um, some of these examples. Well if we run with an empty list um, it will try to see if the empty list is in descending order which it can't be so descends is false and therefore match sorted is true what about this list um, notice how descends is applied to all sorts of sublists because the pattern matcher tries all lists varying length to assign to the variable items so initially it might find an empty list and that doesn't uh, satisfy descends it might find a list of one element that doesn't satisfy descends it finds a list of two elements that doesn't satisfy descends and then it looks to see if there's um, something between the three and the five and it doesn't find something there uh, list containing only five doesn't descend and the list after the three and the five doesn't descend so the whole thing is true you can see it's not a terribly intelligent system um, in that context if I try match sorted five four as before, it looks for right at the beginning of the list, finds the empty list, and that fails. That's good. That's not a count example. It tries the list containing only five, and that fails. That's not a count example. But it then finds the list five, four, and that is uh, that satisfies the test descends, and therefore it fails the test for the whole list being sorted. So the whole list is uh, the whole procedure comes out false because descends comes out true. And if we do this one, uh, we'll have far more tests, a whole lot of them, and they all come out false, and so the whole thing is true. There are no counterexamples here in descending order. With this one, there is a counterexample at the end. Uh, the 1410 is in descending order, and we get a large number of tests, which we can see here, and eventually it gets to 1410, which is true for descends, Whereas all the previous ones are false, and because it's found one that's true, the whole match, um, uh, the whole test for being sorted in ascending order is false. Uh, notice that if we give it match sorted, uh, give match sorted this list going in descending order, it fails much faster. So it does a test on the empty list, and that fails. Does a test on length nine for descends. Uh, a list of length 1 containing the number 9 for descends and that fails but as soon as we get the second item we have 9 and 8 and descends comes out true because that's descending order therefore the whole test for ascending order 
fails and that's false well I won't do the long one there we can untrace descents now what that showed is that using this m the pattern matcher like this although it makes it clear what we're looking for we're looking for some items which satisfy this descends test namely a sublist of length 2 which satisfies descends and that's uh, a visual way of indicating what we're looking for but it's very inefficient because the double equals uh, the double query here allows items of arbitrary uh, uh, sorry, uh, sublists of arbitrary lengths to be assigned to items it can be an empty list, a list of length one, of two, and three, and so on. And we saw before it wasted a lot of time. For instance, up there testing a list of length three, here a link, length uh, a list of length one. So we want to be able to constrain the matching so that it'll only deal with two successive items. Um, it's not possible to specify that for the matches operator for reasons that I won't go into but we can use a, a variant of the matches operator called does match which is more sophisticated basically the difference is the matches thing tries and as soon as it finds some sort of match uh, it will s succeed and um, it won't be able to come back and try another one so when it finds a thing over here which um, satisfies all the conditions before and after and those are very loose conditions anything before anything after after it will um, not necessarily be able to come back uh, and remember enough detail of what it's tried in order to just try something else anyway th that's not a terribly clear explanation but let's look at a, a different uh, technique using a, a um, procedure called um, an operation called does match. So that's just explaining what I've said before. And we now want to go to this library called does match. It's described in the pop 11 help file, help does match, and it's also online in the poplog help does match uh, text file. The format for does match is list does match pattern and the pattern can have things in it like the queries and double equals and uh, restriction procedures and then we can have a bit at the end which has a condition which some po is some pop 11 uh, code which must return the result true or false and does match will succeed only if this returns true and if it returns false then it will go back and try another way of doing the match here because often matches can be done in different ways so I'll show you an example in the definition of the procedure called does match sorted which is going to be like match sorted except it uses do does match instead of matches and as before it'll take a list of numbers and we want to check whether the list uh, the numbers are in increasing order so we prepare a collection of tests as before and then we come down to the definition and as before the definition is essentially pictorial but instead of saying we start with a list of arbitrary length and then do a test on it um, a list found by the matches operation here we'll say we want does match to find some items any number zero upwards then a single item then one item immediately after it and then any number of items which can be uh, th there can be no items or one or two or three and when it finds two items in succession it checks if item one is bigger than item two and if it is then they're not in ascending order and this this bit will come out true but that means that our test for being ascending is failed so we put a not there so it becomes false if this condition is true so let's compile that and then see what happens when it runs escape C is compiled we can come back and do these tests so does match sorted is true for the empty list as it should be three fives two as it should be five fives two as it should be five fours false as it should be 
one, three, six, nine, ten, fourteen is true as it should be. Swap the last two items, false as it should be. And with this long list, it's false um, because it went down from fourteen to ten before going up again. Okay, so we can see what's going on, and we if we trace. Um, this test over here. Now, it is possible to trace the greater than operator, but it's a bit messy. So instead, what I'm going to do is generalize this procedure uh, so that instead of just testing for things that are sorted in increasing order, it can test all sorts of things. And let's see how we can do that. We want to recognize this we might want to recognize list of numbers that are supported in descending instead of ascending order then we'd have to replace this thing the greater than test with a less than test here now in other words if the, if we get item one less than that then they're not descending order because that would be an increasing pair we could just define a new procedure but in in many cases it's more convenient to have a general procedure which instead of having the test built into the code can have the test given as an extra input so instead of one input namely list we'll have two inputs the list and a test procedure and then the generalized version of this thing will do the test over there and so we'll call it does match sorted any because instead of just sorting lists in increasing order, it'll sort all sorts of things in all sorts of ways. So let's see how that definition works. We are going to say, we're going to define a procedure called does match sorted any, which takes a list and a test, a test for two items, two items in the wrong order. Uh, that's what really this thing says here, so we won't repeat it. And let's look at the definition. I'm going to compile it, escape C, and that compiled. So does match sorted any takes two inputs, a list and a test for things being in the wrong order. And this test is going to be applied, wrong order is going to be applied to two items, namely item one and item two, found in the list that does match, uh, is matching against. And if these tests are, if these items are in the wrong order, namely they pass the wrong order test, then this thing shows that what we're looking for is a false result, so we negate this result of this expression. As before, this could be expressed in one long line, although it goes off the end of the screen at the moment, but we still have here this pictorial representation of what we're looking for, two items anywhere in a list with anything before and anything after those items to be matched against that list except that we've added this extra constraint to that picture the two items in the picture if they satisfy this wrong order test will show that we've refuted the hypothesis that the whole list is what of the, the sorted kind so we put a not there because it's not sorted because two things exist in the wrong order Okay, so let's go and let's test that. Um, we have some tests below, so let's go down. Now, we can use that test, does match sorted any, with a list. And if you want to say we're testing for greater than, we can't just put greater than in there, because in POP11 that would make the procedure try to run, the procedure greater than try to run here. So instead we use the word non-op to mean that uh, we're, we're handing the procedure into does match sort, not running it now, we're giving it to it, and then it will run it later when it gets to the relevant bit of the code. And similarly over here we used non-op greater than for all these tests. So we can see what happens whether the empty list is sorted according to that, and it is sorted. Let's go back and clear the window. Do that again, it's true. One three five, it's true. One three five four six is false. And that's because in the middle there's five and four. And uh, here we have 
a number of uh, numbers in increasing order. Here we have also some quite big numbers, but the last pair are in decreasing order, 10,001 followed by 10,000. So that one was false. So th that's a test for the list in increasing order. We can also test for lists being sorted in decreasing order by replacing the non-up greater than with the non-up less than. So as before, does match sorted in E can be applied to the empty list, like that, and as before it's true. The empty list is sorted in increasing and decreasing order. What about 1, 3, 5? Is that sorted in, decreasing, in decreasing order? Um, escape D, that's false. 5, 3, 2, 1, escape D, that's true. Everything's decreasing there. 6, 5, 4, 3, 3, 2, 1, 1, that's true. Everything is decreasing if we allow two things of the same sort to be, to, to be acceptable. Another way of putting that is it's non-increasing. So I've been a bit sloppy in my terminology here. And um, if we change it to this input list, it fails when it gets to 2, 4. And I won't bother with the rest. Now, we have a generic matching uh, testing procedure which can take a list and a test for two items and there's nothing in the definition which says they've got to be numbers so let's go back to our definition of this procedure we've just got the wrong order input procedure and we apply it to two items which are adjacent in the list these two items are adjacent and wrong order is applied to them over here and there's nothing in here that requires these things to be numbers. So, they could be words, or they could be something else. So if they're w words, we might be testing for alphabetical order. They could be mixtures of items, as we'll see later on. So let's go and see what happens if we, given as an input uh, to does match sorted any, a procedure for comparing words, not numbers. So we go back to where we were. Um, we're going to use a, a little d define a little procedure called alpha after which takes two words and returns a result the result will be true or false it's a boolean and it'll be true if word one comes alphabetically after word two well how can we express that pop 11 already has a procedure alpha before if it didn't have such a procedure we could write one by looking at all the characters and the words but i don't want to go into that here so we'll use the pop 11 procedure alpha before alpha before checks if its first argument comes before the second argument or it's the same as the second argument um, we can just uh, illustrate that alpha bef before cat dog and if we test that with escape d it says true if we change dog to bog it says false if we change bog to cat uh, if you compare something with itself it says one which is, means it's not false one is a special kind of truth in this context. It's sometimes useful to know that alpha before is produced one, but you can treat that as true. If we extend cat uh, by turning it into catch, say, it goes back to being true. Um, if, on the other hand, we have a longer one here, is catch before cat, it's false now. So alpha before handles the normal tests for things being in alphabetic or what's sometimes called lexical order and it's true in all the cases where the first item comes before or is equivalent to the second item and we're trying to define the opposite namely something that's true only if the first word comes after the second word so we can do that by saying see if the second word is alpha before the first word if it is then the word one, this first word, must have come after word two, if word two is before word one, alphabetically. So, 
we take this alpha b4 and we negate, negate the result and that gives us the truth of alpha after. So I'm going to compile that and we can uh, just edit this into alpha after. Let's try alpha after catch and cat and that says false which slightly surprises me because I was expecting it to say true. What happens if we have cat and cat? Okay, so wh what, we're, what we're getting here is a, a, a much stronger test. If we have cat and uh, dog have we got here? This specification of alpha after is wrong. We're checking if word 2 comes alphabetically after word 1. I've gone and um, mistyped that. So now we can go back. Alpha after cat dog is true because dog comes alphabetically after cat. Um, what about catch? Does that come alphabetically after? Yes, it does. It's true. What about catch coming... Cat coming alphabetically after catch? That's false. So it was giving the right results. I just got temporarily muddled. Well, tutorials aren't always perfect. So alpha after does what we want. Namely, it checks if word 2 comes alphabetically after word one. And that's like the less than test in arithmetic uh, for numbers. Instead, it's a strong less than test for words. So we can now ask if pear fig apple is in descending order by looking for a counterexample with the two elements in ascending order, where the second element comes alphabetically after the first. Remember the definition of, of our um, does match sorted any is has a big knot in it after the, um, the test is, is, is run. So we run this and it comes out true. Pear, fig, apple, uh, doesn't have an alphabetically after item coming um, in the second part of the test. If I put in here grape, pear, fig, grape, apple, it comes false because grape is alphabetically after fig. So it will find a counterexample to the descending order. Likewise, uh, what about pear, fig, elephant, apple? That's true. Pear, fig, elephant, apple, banana. That's false because banana comes alpha after apple and therefore the counterexample is found by that testing procedure. We can trace alpha after to see what's going on. So I'll turn on tracing, escape D. It's now traced and let's come back and do these some of these things again. So we try this without the grape first. And I'll go and clear the input window, start again. So we can see up here it tries the alpha after tries pear fig and then fig apple and in both cases that's false in other words we don't have something that's in alpha after order so the whole thing is it true it's in descending alphabetic order the whole list is in descending alphabetic order but if we put grape back in and run that we get pear fig false but fig grape with fig grape as input alpha after comes out true so it's found something going up in alphabetic order therefore the test for descending alphabetic order has failed and so the whole thing came out false ignore that true that was what we wanted before we put the word grape in let's try this one pear fig elephant apple and we get pear fig fig elephant elephant apple and it ends up true because there's no counterexample. With this one, 
pair of fig, fig elephant and so on. And the counterexample is found with apple banana. So alpha after finds a counterexample going up instead of down. And so this whole thing is false. So the important thing to notice is that the predicate alpha after is only being applied to two things at a time, whereas in our first use of the matcher, we gave our test procedure a list, and that list could be empty, it could have one element, could have two elements, could have three elements, and so there's a lot of unnecessary testing. So the use of does match enables us to restrict the format in which the tests are run. And here's another one, pear tomato. And um, as we would hope, it finds pear tomato in alphabetically ascending order. So that's true, and therefore the whole thing is false. We can turn off the tracing and do some more um, demonstration of the generality of this um, procedure does match sorted any because we can have a rather a, 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 a procedure a, a kind of test which is uh, not necessarily a simple ordering test for example I'm going to consider whether an, a list that is a mixture of numbers and words where the words only have one letter each and that letter is going to be a uh, vowel or a consonant we can use a variant of this procedure to test whether there is anywhere in the list a vowel followed by a consonant. In other words, we want to test the hypothesis that all vowels, if they occur, are followed by even numbers. How can we identify even numbers? Well, we use the pop 11 operator rem for remainder. 7 rem 2. I'm going to go and clear this thing. Test 7 rem 2 and we get the answer 1. 77 rem 5 gives the answer 2. So that's a remainder on dividing by 5. If we divide by 10, we get the remainder 7. Um, if I change 7 to 6, that's an even number. So dividing by 2 gives the remainder 0. Up there we have the remainder 0. So in general, we can use where the division by 2 gives the answer 0 to 1 as a test for number being even. So here is how we're going to run our test for whether two successive items in a list are counterexamples to the hypothesis that every vowel is followed by an even number. So our test will come out false if we've got an item which is a word that's a one letter word and we've got an item which is an integer because if it's another word then we don't have a, a counterexample the length of the item one must be one so it's a one one letter one character word and furthermore that item must be one of these words a E I O U lowercase A E I O U in uppercase. So there's a vowel and the number should be odd. Um, namely the item two, which is the number, rem two, and then the remainder in division two should be equal to one. So if we get item one and item two, where item one's a word which is a vowel and item 2 is an odd number, then this thing has found a counterexample to our hypothesis that all vowels are followed by even numbers. So we can see how if we compile this, escape C, that's done, and then we just test it to make sure it does what we want. So with A and 4, that's a vowel followed by an even number, it should be true. I'm sorry, we're trying to find a counterexample to that. So vowel followed by an even number should be false, and it is. Uh, vowel followed by an odd number is true. Uh, capital O, which is a vowel followed by an even number, will be false. Capital A followed by an odd number will be true. Small letter B followed by an odd number uh, will be true because B is not a vowel. 
sorry, it's not a counterexample, um, and this is also not a counterexample to the a. The only thing that should come out f true is the case where our hypothesis is falsified, namely a vowel is followed by an odd number. In all the other cases, it should come out true, and that's what it does: true, 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 and true. And in this case. I'm sorry, I have the only case in which it should come out false is the case where the vowel is followed by an even number. That's what the uh, that will not be a counterexample when we're searching down the list. All the others will be true, true. That'll be f that's not a counterexample because it doesn't have a, a vowel. By the way, there's a very well-known paper by Phil Johnson-Laird and Peter Wason, which shows that uh, this kind of test confuses um, lots and lots of people, including grad, uh, mathematics graduates. Um, and I just know what, this, what I, the result should be, but because I'm speaking very fast, I keep getting slightly confused. Anyway, the definition here is OK. It's what we want. I thought it through when I wrote it in. So now we can use it with does match sorted any. We try it with an empty list with vowel odd, and that won't find a count example. We try 15, 76, 9, and it's got no vowels, so it can't find a count example. We want a count example to the hypothesis that a word of length 1 containing a vowel is followed by an even number. If you find a count example, then it should be false. Everything else is true. So here we have only words, no numbers, so it must be true. And here we have some numbers and some words, and in this case we see there's a vowel followed by an odd number, which refutes our, hy our hypothesis because it's found a vowel and odd number, so that should be false. What happens if we replace 3 with an even number? It's still false. Why? Because there's another vowel here, followed by an odd number. If we replace that with an even number, like 16, then the thing is true. It's every vowel is followed by an even number. Uh, we can trace that little procedure, vowel odd. And uh, so, for example, if we come in here with vowel odd and run, I'll go and clear that window again, come back, run that, um, it tries 1516 false, 179 false, because none of those is a counterexample to our hypothesis. Likewise, if we just give it a whole lot of words, we won't find any counterexample. And if we go back to our original list with, say, A3, then it finds a counterexample, which is a vowel followed by an odd number. So that's true, counterexample found. If I replace that with a 2, then it doesn't find any counterexamples. They're all false. But if I put a, an odd number off to the E, as we had before, E7, then it'll go through, escape D, trying all these things, 2, B, 4, B, and eventually it'll get to E7. And whereas all the others are false, they're not counterexamples, E7 is a counterexample, so that's true, and therefore the whole th hypothesis is false. So, we can come back here, and um, uh, in fact, this is just showing it running on that test with the vowel log traced. And here's another example of running which we've just been through. We can untrace vowel log. So, what we've done is take an example procedure using does match to test a list for some property, namely being increasing in order or decreasing in order or um, not having any vowel followed by an odd number uh, and we could have had other tests uh, provided the test applies only to two successive elements in the list. We can use that more general form that we've defined above um, 
which is up here. Um, sorry, where is the uh, dust match? Here's the procedure. The general form of the procedure takes a list as input and something searching for items in the wrong order, two items in the wrong order. We can use that for many kinds of uh, test. If we want to uh, specify a test that is going to be used many times, like the test increasing or the test uh, uh, decreasing for a list of numbers, then we can create a new testing procedure by partially applying this thing does match sorted any to the required test. So if we apply it to the test for things going up, then this thing here up with that test going up would be together combined to form a test for everything being in decreasing order because the, the things going up uh, will be the wrong order. And likewise, if we combine this for things being um, going down, then that combination will give us a procedure testing for things being in increasing order. Well, there's a notation for doing that, which I'll jump to uh, near the end. Right, so we can define increasing as a procedure which equals this procedure does match any which I've just been talking about combined with or partially applied to the greater than procedure with the non-op in front as before and these percent symbols mean we're not running this procedure now but we're creating a new procedure from that procedure by combining this procedure with that one so that means that if we compile this bit of this definition we now have a procedure called increasing which has that thing and that already in it so all we have to give it now is a list so down here we can give increasing this list one two four six seven eight and it comes out true it tested if we give it one two four six three seven eight it comes out false because it found the six three going in the wrong order likewise we can define a test for decreasing I'm going to mark and control D there, where we have combined does match sorted any with the less than so, uh, operator non op less than and we can call the combination decreasing and then we can use that to test if these lists are in decreasing order well that one is it all goes down and if we try it on this one it's false because it goes down from a thousand to five 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 and it goes up to six hundred so decreasing here has a combination of does match sorted any with non-op less than remember the less than is the check for an exception to what we want decreasing to find I suspect that in human intelligence this ability to learn something by looking at examples and then seeing that those different uh, examples form a kind of pattern that can be generalized is quite important and it's especially important in programming and in mathematics. We've seen an example in programming where we've noticed that there can be a commonality between searching, uh, testing a list for increasing order and testing a list for decreasing order of numbers and those both of them also have something in common with testing a list of words for being in alphabetic order and other things so we from those examples we form the higher level abstraction and then we, when we've got that higher level abstraction we can form special cases of it by combining that abstract thing as we did here with something else that makes it more specific I think a lot of human intelligence depends on that. It may be that people are doing that often without realizing they're doing it, but certainly mathematicians and programmers have to be aware of what they're doing in order to get their generality. Well, in POP11 there's more information about everything that I've presented in this tutorial, uh, including how to define procedures. There's uh, the use of the POP11 stack, which I haven't mentioned, but is implicit in a lot of what I've been talking about in this. Um, T 
TeachSort shows how to use a built-in procedure in POP11, or rather it's a library procedure, which given a list of words or numbers will always return a sorted list. But that one cannot take a mixture of lists or numbers. There is a more general procedure called SysSort, which can be given a mixture, but then you have to give it a comparison test, as we did with the example above. And uh, teach percent explains the notation for using the percent symbol to create closures of the sort that I did when I said um, we can partially apply does match sorted to either non up greater or non up less, or we could apply it to alpha before or to something else. Um, these percent symbols change the procedure application brackets into partial application brackets. And the help closures file gives more information on closures and all of those files are available on the web as well as being part of the poplog system end of this tutorial <laughs>